when nuclear disasters are mentioned, 90% of people think of Chernobyl. A little less will remember Fukushima, and the true intellectuals will brag about being subscribed to our channel and knowing the accident on Three Mile Island. But only a few people know about the third most serious nuclear disaster ever at the Mayak plant. Why do residents believe that the government experimented on them? How did the USSR actually get an atomic bomb? And why is it still strictly forbidden to visit an area the size of a European country? To answer these questions, let's talk about science for a moment. There are practically no differences between a nuclear reactor and an atomic bomb. When exploded, both will cause the same fun events with the potential of becoming a great video game. However, to create a weapon, we need it to be compact, lightweight, and have lethal force. This is why plutonium-239, the lightest on the chemical table, is used for most nuclear weapons. Conventional nuclear reactors are capable of producing it, but it is expensive. Therefore, at the dawn of the nuclear arms race, specialized reactors were built for this purpose. In the United States, a similar Wonder Waffle was built in 1943 at the Hanford plant. Reactor B was the first facility in the world to produce weapons-grade plutonium. The filling for the bomb Fat Man that bombed Nagasaki was produced there. Of course, the USSR was noticeably jealous of that fact, and Stalin personally ordered that the creation of the atomic bomb was supervised by his best colleague, Beria, and the project itself was of the utmost importance for the country. As you now understand, such a project required a reactor to create weapons-grade plutonium. So on November 9, 1945, a village called Baza 10 for 5,000 people was founded near Shelabinsk. All these are builders and service personnel for the Mayak plant. And on June 9, 1948, the first reactor in Eurasia, A1, was launched at the Mayak. It produced weapon-grade plutonium. And let's just briefly mention the cost. Instead of the planned 5,000 people in order to meet the deadline, 50,000 were brought to the construction site, and people walked 10 kilometers just to get bread. But the job was done, and so the future closed city of Ozersk, which was not on any maps, appeared. Residents signed a non-disclosure agreement, and in their passports, it said that they lived in the neighboring Shelabinsk. By the way, Ozersk still has the title of a closed city, but that's beside the point. Now, the main thing is that any nuclear industry has quite a smelly waste. And in order for your country to not look like a setup for the next Fallout game, this waste needs to be properly disposed of. Who took care of that in the USSR? That's right, no one. And so the waste of the Mayak plant was thrown into the neighboring river Techa. When all the animals suddenly began dying, an elegant solution was created. The Mayak waste was dumped into Lake Karache. After all, Regular people don't have access to it, and it's not connected to other water sources. Brilliant, isn't it? It's a pity that nature did not find it as brilliant. In a short period of time, 150 million curies of radiation were dumped into Karachay. For comparison, this is about three Chernobyls. And imagine the surprise when the lake decided to become a little shallower and all the stuff resurfaced. As a result, the guys decided to come up with something more eco-friendly. They began to fill the lake up in 1986 and finished in 2015. Of course, they didn't care about nature. Their reasoning to stop disposing of waste in Karachi was so that workers don't drop like flies. In 1953, for the waste, they built concrete storage facilities with several meter high walls underground. They were located two meters deep and people drained the waste into them. However, we are talking about very radioactive and hot things. So the storages had to be cooled down cooling systems are key at the nuclear power plant, so important that in many ways the shutdown of cooling systems caused the Chernobyl catastrophe. But at the same time, cooling is expensive and requires constant maintenance. On the other hand, there is production of plutonium that requires overworking to produce the unrealistic amount needed. Therefore, little attention was paid to the waste storage. People thought it's not that big of a deal if something blew up underground. However, as it turns out, on September 29, 1957, this outcome should not have been undermined. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, a powerful explosion hit, shaking the surrounding villages and visible from a far distance. Cooling failed, and the waste simply overheated, even though it was underground and in concrete. There are three lucky coincidences in this story. The first is the fullness of the container. Out of available 300 cubic meters, there was only 80. This leads to a second coincidence, the thermal nature of the explosion. If it had been nuclear, 
Mayak and the surrounding territories could have been leveled with ground. Finally, luckily it was Sunday, and at least there were no victims of the explosion. But unfortunately, 20 million curies of radiation shot out of the container. This is about half the amount at Chernobyl, and according to the list of nuclear accidents, only Chernobyl and Fukushima are above the accident at the Mayak. The real hell started after the explosion. People who defend the Soviet actions should have been there, in the surrounding villages and towns, where for the next six days, people were unaware of what's happening. A week later, the newspaper in Shelyabinsk wrote about the rare phenomenon for this area, Northern Lights. Of course, it was actually a cloud of radioactive dust and smoke, shining with all the colors of the rainbow. Only six days later, the evacuation of the most affected localities began. Do you want the numbers? Of the 270,000 who got a taste of the radioactive cloud, only 20 were evacuated. And those were only from the 20-kilometer zone. And the evacuation took several months. Meanwhile, Mayak liquidators were drafted from all over the country. Of course, under a strict non-disclosure agreement, Ozersk itself, according to officials, was not damaged in the explosion, and the cloud supposedly bypassed it. And all actual deaths were recorded as cancer or vegetative vascular dystonia. However, a zone called the East Ural Radioactive Trace was created. Grasslands, reservoirs, forests, and animals, everything full of radiation. Therefore, residents were ordered to kill livestock, forbidden to grow anything, and instructed to constantly wash the floors. Again, these territories were officially still considered habitable. The exact details and names, of course, remained classified, and residents kept getting contradicting information. The official number of victims is listed as a couple hundred. But to understand the situation, we will go to the village of Tater Karabolka. It is located 40 kilometers from the plant. In 1957, it was inhabited by 4,000 people. Now, there are 400. And the most remarkable thing is that there are eight cemeteries on the territory of the tiny village at once. And this is just one of the settlements in the district. Gulshara Ismagalova only laughs at the statement about the harmlessness of the accident. According to her, seven out of eight cemeteries are oncological. The granddaughter of her neighbors lived only 13 years, and according to Kulshara, there are similar stories in every family. She herself suffers from liver cancer, her brother died of stomach cancer, and her mother has thyroid cancer. Do you know what the wildest thing is? The USSR didn't officially recognize the incident until 1986, and the residents of Tatarkarabolka were surprised to find out that they lived in a dangerous area and according to the documents, they were relocated in some other place back in 1959. And all this time, people ate radioactive vegetables and burned radioactive trees. Wood is known to absorb the most radiation. And they had no choice, since gas was connected only recently and is available for a fee. And after hearing all that, would you call Golshara crazy for claiming that the government experimented on people to see how they withstand radiation? We wouldn't. But the real problem is that there probably isn't an experiment, just local governors trying to save their asses and look better in the eyes of their bosses. And that story isn't just about the USSR. In the 80s, it was revealed that the CIA was well aware of the accident and all the details. But the agency did not share data with the public because they were afraid that Americans would start doubting nuclear energy. They had their own problems at the wind scale reactor in the upcoming Three Mile Island. No one cared about ordinary people. And so that you understand, the worst part is that the very next day after the explosion, the Mayak reactor was already back in business, and the plant itself is still working. However, thank God, their waste now is without plutonium. For those who claim that the explosion is an isolated accident, we recall that over the past 60 years, more than 30 different accidents with emissions have occurred at the Mayak. In 2005, some new information surfaced Apparently, Mayak was still dumping waste into the same river Techa as in the good old 50s. And in 2017, even the official authorities confirmed the highest content of ruthenium-106. However, there is no data on new incidents. After all, the good old USSR taught the world that terrible disasters can be easily hidden for decades, and if needed, people will be silenced. You can fake medical books and threaten to fire doctors who write the truth. This is the essence of the story about Mayak which unfortunately is rarely mentioned in our days. See you later, friends.